Well, morning, everyone. I guess I ought to introduce myself a little bit for those who don't know me. Um, I lead the church in Beverly, with, along with my wife, Carolyn, who's here as well. Also, my son, Josh, and his wife, Karina, are accompanying us today, because after this, we're off to Lincoln to celebrate uh, one of our grandchildren's 12th birthday. So, hence, we're, we've come mob-handed this morning. Um, as well as leading the church in Beverly, um, on behalf of Ground Level, I represent Ground Level in churches together in England, which me, lead, me, leads to me trotting off to London quite regularly, meeting with bishops and goodness knows who, which is all good fun. Um, but I, my heart is with local church. I also um, lead a Bible school, uh, which Teresa and Paul have been part of in the last couple of years, and I'm part of Ground Level Leadership Engine. So that's me. In, in short. Um, and at, at, at heart, as I say, my heart is for local church, for the people of God living in community today, together. I've actually prepared two messages this last week. The first one I prepared, um, and then God said to me, that's not the one you're going to deliver. So he told me to speak about hope, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. What is hope? Well, Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. But what is hope? Well, the dictionary definition of hope is to entertain a wish for something with some expectation. To entertain a wish for something with some expectation. That is a definition which covers our everyday use of the word hope. I hope it will be a sunny afternoon this afternoon. I don't know that it will be a sunny afternoon. The forecast is favourable, and I expect it to be right. Maybe I'm just deluded when I listen to the weather forecast. But biblical hope is much stronger than that. It's not a vague wish, but a confident expectation. It's not rooted in some kind of might-be, might-not-be scenario. It's rooted in the Word of God. You see, God's Word is truth. And we can trust what is written within its pages. It's not a possibility concerning the future. It's a fact concerning the future. And when the word proclaims that I will be resurrected one day, that is my hope. In other words, I'm confident that in God that that which I hope for, that which he's promised me, will come to pass. I don't look forward to death in the vague wish of being resurrected, but in the sure knowledge that that, that will happen. The only area of uncertainty is that it's not happened yet. Thank goodness. And so the foundation of hope is not feelings or desires, but is based in truth and in knowledge of the word of God. It's not based on wishful thinking, but on what God's word says is true and will be. And it's only when it's founded on truth that hope can grow into faith. It's only on such a foundation that hope is truly hope in a biblical sense, rather than just a vague wish. So as we look forward to the future, in whatever form, we should do so in the confident expectation that the Word of God tells us the truth. Romans 8, 24-25 says this, For in hope we've been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we have hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we await eagerly for it. And Paul is saying there, we've been saved with hope in our hearts, hope for the future, hope that God has a, our future in his hands, hope that we have a destiny that goes beyond this life. And we eagerly await for it because that hope is sure and steadfast. So this morning I want us to think about all the things that we can hope for as a result of what Jesus has done. Firstly, Jesus is the hope of our salvation. We look forward to in the hope of the resurrection. Christ is in us the hope of glory. Our hope is tied up with Christ's return. Hope is also the helmet of salvation. And we are to be prepared to give an account for the hope that is in us. And we're going to look at each of those things in turn. So we begin with Jesus is the hope of our salvation. 
Matthew 12, 21 says, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. And Paul repeats this same verse in Romans 15, 12. And essentially Paul reaffirms that the hope of Israel has come to the Gentiles. We are in Christ Jesus and therefore the hope that God gave Israel has come to us and we are grafted into the family of God's people. And the salvation promised to Israel has come to us. The covenant promises of God have now come down upon us for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. You and I are recipients of the hope that Israel held for centuries and it's come down on us because of what Jesus has done. And in 1 Peter 1, 3, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We're born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It's the resurrection which is the proof of the salvation of God. And so our hope is not in, in dead words, but in the fact that Christ has risen from the dead. He is the first fruits of the resurrection. He has triumphed over death. Death could not hold him. And as a result, we can have confidence in the salvation that God has given to us. For forgiveness, redemption, restoration. And these things are not based on empty promises, but on the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It's no wonder that the enemy has tried to undermine this truth in recent days, in the last few years. Because if he can undermine the resurrection, he removes from us our hope. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we've hoped in Christ in this life only, we're of all men most to be pitied, or as the King James Version says, most miserable. But now Christ has been raised from the dead and the first fruits of those who are, who are, have, who are asleep. But Christ did rise from the dead. And Peter himself testified to it. And each of the disciples died a martyr's death, still clinging to the truth of that word. Don't believe any Da Vinci Code twaddle about Jesus' body being taken with Mary Magdalene to France. There's no documentary or other evidence of that happening. It's just wild speculation. Hear instead the words of Peter himself as we've just read them. The hope that we have is tied up in the fact, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus was the divine Son of God, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and now reigns, interceding on our behalf. That's the truth. And so on the basis of that, we look forward to the resurrection that, um, that God will bring for each one of us. We look forward to our own resurrection, just as he was raised from the dead. And we will not be raised again in this perishable body. We will be raised in a perfect body. Again, hear the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, which I'll just t turn to. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Sorry, 42, not 29. I don't know where that came from. 42. So also, as so is the resurrection of the dead, it's sown a perishable body, it's raised an imperishable body, it's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory, it's sown in weakness, it's raised in power, it's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. And if there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Verse 49, just as we've been born the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Our hope is in the fact that when this four score years and ten or however many years God gives us on this earth have ended, that's not the end of our life, but a start of a new phase of existence. Many spend their whole lives seeking to leave at some kind of monument in this world to their achievements or to their fame. They raise statues, write memoirs, seek to achieve great things, all to be remembered by subsequent generations but at the end of the day, that is all worthless. As Robin Williams says in Dead Poet Society, we are food for worms, lads. Our achievements in this life, such as they are, will fade and be forgotten. They won't amount to a hill of beans, to quote Humphrey Bogart from Casablanca. 
The only real purpose in this life is ensuring that we have a hope in eternity. And it's this which Jesus has provided for us. Our ultimate hope in this life is that we will be resurrected from the dead and we will reign with him in glory. And so we come to the fact that we look forward to the resurrection and we also look forward to our glorification. And that's what Paul says in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And this is, reminds us that our present bodies are weak and frail, and they will, but they will one day be glorious, and that will occur at the resurrection. It's not that we have to be morbid and say, come, blessed heart attack, and make me perfect. <laughs> it's not that we look forward to death in hope, but that we know on the other side of the curtain our hope will be fulfilled. Our life will continue in a more glorious state. Our expectation will be realized and we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The older you get, the more attractive is the body that God has got stored up for you. The more we wrestle with temptation and try to be like Christ and the dead weight of this mortal body upon us, the more we can know that the life which is already deep within us will one day be in every part of us. That new resurrection life that God has already put within us will burst forth and recreate this, this physical body and we look forward in hope to that time when we will be like him. And so we exult in the hope of the glory of God as Paul says in Romans 5.2. In other words, our future glorification is a source of much rejoicing in this life. And if in the meantime we fail and we sin, don't sweat it. Yeah, we need to confess it and sort it out with God, but this is also a reminder to us that one day we will not sin, because we will be like him. Paul says in Galatians 5.5, For through the Spirit, by faith, we're waiting for the hope of righteousness. And within us there is a deep expectation. And whilst we get on with our daily lives, there is an expectancy, an excitement in what God will achieve in us at and through the resurrection. And in Ephesians 1.18, Paul declares that the hope of our calling is not just our own glorification, but a rich inheritance. And this will also be received after the resurrection. Our hope is also tied up with Christ's return. Do you hope that he will come soon? Yeah, yeah one or two do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would indeed. The, yeah, yeah, yeah with, well, the work isn't finished until he gets here, and he knows the right time. He will come at just the right moment. But we look forward to that day. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And even if we are not dead when Christ returns, nevertheless we will be transformed and given our immortal bodies. And the imminent return of Christ is that on which we set our hope. Paul says to Titus that we are looking forward, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ. And we say with John, as he says at the end of Revelation, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. And he replies, yes, I'm coming quickly. So we have hope for the future. We have hope beyond the grave. We have hope in the, in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also have a helmet of hope. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says, But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. The hope of salvation is the knowledge that God will raise us from the dead and glorify us. And this is a helmet which God has given us to protect our minds from the rampages of the devil. The enemy will seek to undermine this truth in us. And if he cannot make us doubt the resurrection of Christ itself, he will seek to undermine our confidence in the future. See, the world has no hope for the future. We do have. We are a people of hope. The knowledge of this is that which will defend our minds from the attacks of the enemy, who will seek to tell us that we are not gods. He'll seek to tell us that we are worthless, and even that God doesn't exist so that our hope is snatched away from us. But our protection lies in affirming the truth of what the Word of God says about us and our future. 
And it's upon this that we can stand strong this morning. It's on this that it is this that will protect us from the enemy's attacks. Trust in the word of God and put on the helmet of hope that will help protect from the enemy's attacks. And then 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to make a defence to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So knowing the truth of all that Jesus has achieved for us and all that God has stored up for us, Peter encourages each one of us to be prepared to tell others about it. As I said earlier, the world needs hope. And we're a people of hope. And where else can they get hope from except the people of hope and the God who gives hope? And so Peter encourages us to tell others about it. Not only do we have hope for ourselves, but we, have, we are the hope of the world. The world is without hope, without Christ, and we have the message which will bring them hope. And we're most selfish if we keep it to ourselves, even if they won't listen. Be prepared to share. Be prepared to give your testimony. Think daily about the good things God has done for you and continues to do for you. Don't shy off, but go for it. Who knows what God will open up for us and through us as we launch out with him and speak of the hope that God gives to each one of us. And all that we've just looked at is wonderful truth and stuff we should rejoice in and set our hope in for the future. But what about now in my daily life? What hope is there to get me through until my blessed glorification? Well, I've got a confession this morning. Sometimes I can get depressed. Sometimes I can be quite fed up. Anyone, anyone join me in that? I know I'm not the, not the only one. And as we read through the Psalms, we see David also experience this, this same kind of emotion. And what was his solution? His solution was to talk to himself. Now, I know this is the first sign of madness, but it does work. Psalm 42, verses 5 to 8. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and his song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. So David begins by talking to himself and just saying, why are you feeling like this? What's going on inside? Why are you downcast, my soul? Why have you become disturbed? Reset yourselves. Press the reset button and remember what God has done and what he's enabled and what his future, the future he has given to you. Trust in the Lord, hope in God, he says. Lift your eyes up. Put them back where they should be. Now, so that's David's solution to, to, to not wallowing in misery but rather reminding himself of the goodness of God in, and in all the places where he's been blessed. He also reminds himself of the loving kindness of the Lord, of his blessed character, which is for, uh, for us and for our good. And it's in these things that he puts his hope. He doesn't ignore his condition, but he changes his perspective with reference to, to his condition. And this is how we can overcome it's to cease to look at our problems alone, but to look at them from the perspective of God's greatness and his grace and mercy towards us. The problems don't go away, but our view on them changes. And so his instruction is hope in God. Renew, refresh your hope in God and in his goodness and in his faithfulness and in the destiny that he has and the future that is safe in his hands. There is no such thing as a hopeless case in God because God wants to give each one of us hope 
a hope that goes deep, not just for our future, but for our day-to-day -day living. And that hope is encapsulated in this verse. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And whilst that was given specifically to Israel to give them hope during their captivity, when they were facing a situation that seemed completely hopeless, they were away from their homeland, the temple had been destroyed, and they were just there waiting, not knowing what the future held. And so Jeremiah writes to them and says, Look, God has a future and a hope for you. And this is a promise that God can also speak into our hearts. God has a plan for each one of us. And we can rest confidently knowing that God is working out his plan in our lives. And God works all things according to his good pleasure. And that pleasure is that he wants to bless each one of us. And our starting point in getting hope for each day is in believing that God is for us, that he's on our side, and that we will walk, he will walk with us to the darkest night and the brightest day. And that is where our hope must rest. Finally, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, we see hope as one of the three muses, faith, hope, and love. And it's one of the things that will endure to the end. And it's that which will keep us in the game when all other things fail. So I just want to encourage us this morning, hold on to your hope in God, even in the dark times, even when things are crowding in, even when the mountain seems too big to get past. Hope in God, trust in his goodness, his faithfulness, his mercy, his love. And allow him to reshape your perspective to carry you through. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're a good God, a God who loves and cares for us, and a God who gives us hope, hope now, hope for the future, hope for eternity. And I pray, Lord God, that, that where hope has been dashed, you will lift our eyes again. You will help us to look afresh on all that you are and all that you've done, and to build that, that hope once more, that we can look and move into the future and into the destiny and the purpose that you have for us. Pray your blessing on each one of us now. Amen.